Okay, so uh, we prepared some lecture notes. Uh, so if you go to that uh, web page, and you can even do it right now, uh, and so when you click on it, you'll see it's 100 pages long. Don't panic, I'm only lecturing on a fraction of that. Um, so these are lecture notes that are going to be turned into a, a, a physics report. So it's done with uh, John Joseph Carrasco and Marco Tiradoli, Henrik Johansson, and Radu Roybon. Uh, I'm not going to have any references in my lecture here, so if you want uh, references, just go click on that and you'll find uh, plenty of references. There's also homework in there. Uh, there's a couple of the homeworks are uh, research projects, but most of the homeworks <laughs> are doable. Um, so what I'll be talking about is this idea of uh, an equivalence between uh, color and kinematics. And normally, when we think of this, we're normally thinking in this direction, uh, where we try to convert the color into kinematics. And the reason why we do that is because it gives us uh, relations between gauge theory and uh, gravity. And this is uh, very practical, but it's very useful for studying quantum gravity. So what we do uh, uh, extremely high loop orders, uh, which I'll talk about it in my uh, second and third lecture. Uh, and then uh, another application, which uh, is just at the very beginning, but I think it has a lot of potential, and I'm sure you're going to hear about that in, in the coming years, is uh, the problem of uh, gravitational radiation. Now, this is a problem that I'd say it's pretty obvious why it's an interesting problem. Uh, and there's a lot of commonality between the problem of gravitational radiation and, uh, and scattering amplitudes. Uh, so that's the likely place where you'll find uh, new applications. Uh, so let's just get started. Well, let's start with the Lagrangian. So what's the Yang-Mills Lagrangian? Okay, you all know it. And what's the Einstein-Hilbert Lagrangian? <coughs> Square to minus g, and this is of course the uh, the Ricci scalar. And uh, to do perturbation theory in the conventional way, what we do is uh, we take uh, the metric, and what we do is uh, we let's say expand around flat space or, or some other space and these excitations of the gravitons. Now, uh, when you do that, uh, you can interpret this following the standard techniques of quantum field theory in terms of some Feynman rules. Uh, so let's just have a look at uh, what Feynman rules tell us about uh, a relationship between these two types of theories. So, uh, what I'm going to say is that you can obtain gravity from gauge theory. So let's just uh, have a look at uh, what would happen if you tried understanding that just from the standard way of thinking about things. So we all know the three gluon vertex, mu A, mu B, and this would be, let's say, P1, P2, P3. And this three gluon vertex, well, we all know what it is, GFABC, P1 minus P2, sigma, and then eta mu nu, and then plus uh, cyclic permutations. So that's very nice. And then, of course, there's a four gluon vertex, and, and that's, uh, that's all good. Um, now let's have a look at uh, gravity. If you try the same game, you take the Einstein action and you plug in this expansion and then you extract Feynman rules. Well, what happens is you get a three vertex, a four vertex, a five vertex, a six vertex, and so on. So uh, you can just look at this and say, well, gee, this doesn't look at all like this theory. Um, 
And then you can also start looking at, at uh, some details. For example, if we uh, have mu, nu, sigma, and then we have alpha, beta, gamma, P1, P2, P3, and you just look at what the vertices look like. Uh, so you can go look this up, uh, maybe in uh, some papers from, from DeWitt. Um, and what you find is that the three vertex, uh, well, I'm not going to write it all out. That's going to take a little too long. But uh, it's some kind of a mess where the sim means you're supposed to symmetrize. Uh, there's a symmetric tensor. The, the graviton of symmetric tensor is supposed to symmetrize over those indices. And then there's a permutation, just like a compact way of writing the, this expression. Let's say p1 dot p2, eta mu alpha, eta nu beta, uh, eta sigma gamma, k plus, uh, then let's say there's a p6. And then um, let's say p1 nu, p1 beta, eta mu alpha, eta sigma gamma, and by now I've run out of energy. There's quite a few terms. Uh, and, and there's about 100 terms, give or take. And if you, if you uh, embed this inside a more complicated diagram, the momenta are sums of momenta. So pretty soon, these pieces, can be, you can have thousands of, of uh, terms in there if the diagram is uh, complicated enough. And, and this, this object, even just the three vertex, never mind uh, these beasts, uh, well, we could say it explodes. Uh, so at the end of the lecture, which I hope to get to, I'll be talking about a calculation that if you tried doing it by just following the Feynman rules, then you would not find enough computer power anywhere on this planet to actually do the problem. Uh, so that's what I mean by a rapid explosion. Now, uh, there's a hint that this is not the right way to look at it. A very simple hint that you could get by thinking about things the on-shell way, which uh, you heard already from Newton, and there's going to be many more lectures. Uh, in this lecture, I'm not going to use spinner helicity except in a few places, but, uh, but anyway, let's just, let's just uh, uh, imagine that we've put it on shell. So what we do is we take uh, the polarization tensor, the polarization tensor of the graviton, epsilon mu nu, and what we're going to do is we're going to impose on shell conditions on it. So we're going to impose the fact that it's traceless. Actually, if you look here, right there, you'll see that there's a uh, trace right here, eta mu alpha. That's a trace of a graviton. That term you should just throw away. And then you should start throwing away a lot of other terms. Epsilon mu nu equals 0. Uh, there's the on-shell conditions. So if this is the first polarization, that's 0. Or uh, contracting with the other index. It's also zero. And you can use these conditions to just throw away terms. It's contracted into to this, use these conditions. And uh, what happens is this three graviton vertex undergoes a fantastic simplification. And uh, that simplification the, what the goes, oh, this is the gravitational coupling constant. Uh, it just goes to two copies of the Yang-Mills vertex, eta mu nu plus cyclic. That's one copy. And the second copy, uh, P1 minus P2. Actually, it should be P3. No, uh, P2. Uh, uh, gamma, alpha, eta. Alpha, beta plus cyclic. Cyclic. So you already have a pretty good hint that there is some relationship. See this thing, and uh, so this is 
one copy, and then the other copy has is the same except the indices are the, indi the second set of indices. Okay, um, now, uh, even knowing this, it's not so obvious how you're supposed to turn the entire S matrix, not just the three-point vertex, into a story where you can just convert the scattering amplitudes of gauge theory uh, to gravity and how to do that also at loop order. Uh, in fact, this thing was well known from, from uh, early days of string theory. People understood this. But the question is how to exploit this and, and uh, what's the general structure. Okay, so that gets us to the duality. Duality. So let's consider uh, gluon diagrams. And let me label them one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And oops. So this is uh, make this leg four, and then for the different channels, I'll call this the S channel. And then I'll cycle it around. So this will make it uh, two, three. Two, three, one, three, one, two. So this we'll call the S, the T, and the U. And let's define S is P1 plus P2 squared. T is P2 plus P3 squared. And U is P1 plus P3 squared. Oop. Uh, uh, U is Yaroslav was frowning, so that that definitely was a bad sign. Uh, I see there's a cutoff, except like like right there. Okay, um, and there's a, also a, a four gluon vertex, but I want to play a little game with it. Uh, so that contact term. It contains color factors that look just like the color factors associated with these diagrams. Uh, and I'm just going to put back the missing propagator. If I see a color factor that looks like a color factor of this diagram, then what I do is I just multiply and divide by the missing propagator. So I use a fancy identity like S over S is equal to 1 to just put back the missing diagram. So just absorb the, this diagram absorb. <coughs> so just absorb it into the other diagrams. So in this way, we can write the uh, Yang-Mills numerator, the, the Yang-Mills amplitude, uh, in terms of a numerator, color factor, a Feynman propagator for the three different channels. Okay, uh, and, and these uh, these uh, color factors. Let me just put it up here. Oh, I give up. I'll just go over here. Um, the color factors. Well, they're just uh, the normal thing that you know. You're supposed to dress the vertices with the FABCs. Uh, but I'm going to normalize it in a funny way, so maybe I'll make it with a with a little uh, twiddle, just to tell you that I'm normalizing generators in a funny way. Uh, well, the funny way is actually the standard way in amplitudes, uh, so maybe it's funny for Peskin and Schroeder, but it's not funny for us. Uh, so this is just uh, the two FABCs, and the same thing. Uh, the CT and the CU, uh, you know, are obvious what you do. You just uh, sew, sew up the diagrams. Uh, the normalization, if you really care, the twiddle ABC is I square root of 2. Uh, 
anyway, it's like a down G's. It's like, oh, okay. Uh, twiddle uh, ABC is equal to uh, I root 2, just the ordinary F ABC. Okay, and then uh, it's a very simple exercise. Uh, uh, by the way, the last time I gave a lecture uh, where I used Feynman, Feynman rules, people booed me, but uh, so, so don't boo me, but I'm going to go ahead and just use Feynman rules uh, because we're going to talk about a problem that's relatively simple uh, to do this four point. You don't need anything high tech, so let's just use Feynman rules. So this numerator uh, this we'll just write it out. 2 epsilon 1 dot p2 uh, epsilon 2 mu minus 1 goes to 2. Uh, I'm using uh, on-shell conditions to clean it up slightly, but, but it's just uh, straight use of uh, what's in Peskin and Schroeder. Epsilon 3 dot epsilon 4 p3 mu plus 2 epsilon 3 dot p4 epsilon 4 mu um, minus 3 goes to 4. Well, never mind about the raising and the lowering. And then, uh, so this, uh, this is from the three vertices and then from the four vertex you get uh, epsilon 1 dot epsilon 3, epsilon 2 dot epsilon 4, uh, minus uh, epsilon 1 dot epsilon 4, epsilon 2 dot epsilon 3. Okay, so that's pretty simple. Um, so we can, we can uh, first check out uh, um, gauge invariance. So uh, so let's go over here. Also, I should say the, the other numerators, uh, you can just get it by simple relabeling. So CT times NT. I mean, just take 1 goes to t 2 goes to 3 goes to 1. And of course, uh, for the U, the same thing. Just, re just relabel it. OK. So let's study gauge invariance. So if you take the polarization vector and you replace it with the momentum, so that basically makes the leg longitudinal, then what's supposed to happen is the amplitude, this four-point amplitude is supposed to go to zero when you do that. Um, now when you make that little substitution on this numerator, just a, a little bit of arithmetic you have to do. So, for homework, go do the just do a little bit of algebra. Um, what you find is that this becomes uh, something pretty simple: cyclic one, two, three. And let me just define that equal to s identical times some function uh, of, the, of the remaining polarizations and the momenta. Now the important thing is that this thing has the cyclic structure. Uh, so when you do that, what you find Hmm. 
Yeah, sorry for these little breaks. Is there a better eraser somehow? I think this one. Uh, uh, uh. Okay, well. Okay, so uh, what happens if you look now at the following combination? So this is the combination in the amplitude. So, so the amplitude somewhere. Where was it? I guess it's not here, but uh, the amplitude we wrote it. We wrote it as this combination of numerators uh, and denominators. Well, what does this thing go to? Well, notice the factor of S in front. And then the rest of it is cyclic invariant. So, uh, so what then happens is uh, you just get uh, CS plus CU plus C CT plus CU times alpha. Now, what is that? And that, in fact, is just the Jacobi identity. So if you look at the color, I'm going to start stop drawing these wavy lines because it's too hard. So it's the color 1, 2, 3, 4, plus the color, leave 4 alone, 2, 3, 1, plus the color Uh, three, one, two, four. You'll recognize that that's just the Jacobi identity. That's the Jacobi identity. So this is going to be equal to zero. And you say, well, okay, that's very nice. Uh, you just uh, had this long-winded explanation of uh, how gauge invariance works in gauge theory. It works because the Jacobi identity is active. So I now have a homework assignment for you. Uh, you just take that uh, wherever it was, this thing. And what you do is you add up NS plus NT plus NU. And so you do this for homework. Homework, simple homework because it's just momentum conservation on shell conditions. And you'll find this is equal to zero as well. Okay? Now, actually, this was noticed 40 years ago. Uh, now, you probably, if you haven't seen this before, or you don't know it's coming, you'd probably say that's very amusing. What of it? It's just uh, some curiosity about four point amplitudes. And, and in fact, it, it doesn't really matter exactly how you do it, what Feynman rules you use, what gauges you're in. As long as you're using the on-shell conditions, you'll discover that this is, this is true at four points, assuming the legs are on-shell. So that you have to really use. Okay, so you look at this and you say, hmm, that's kind of interesting. Well, if color is like kinematics, well, what happens if I do the following? So from here you can be inspired to do try something. Let's define another amplitude. So I'm just making this thing up. Um, well, let's call it a gravity amplitude. Uh, and this gravity amplitude, I just make this substitution. I want, uh, I want the color to go to the kinematics. I want, uh, what I want to do, well, let me just erase, make a little space here. What I want is I want to make this substitution because I notice that the algebraic properties of these objects is the same as the algebraic properties of the, of the, of the, uh, uh, these numer the color and the kinematics, the numerator, it satisfies 
the same uh, the same uh, properties. And then also the observation is that gauge invariance relies uh, precisely on the Jacobi identity, which is satisfied by this. So you don't have to think too hard to realize that it's probably a good idea to inspect this combination. And this thing is automatically gauge invariant, this object. It inherits the gauge invariance from here. But first what we should do is let's define epsilon mu nu is defined to be this product. Okay. Now if it's a graviton, you want to symmetrize. But anyway, let's take it as, as our product. Now we all know that a graviton, the diffeomorphism invariance, the linearized one, is, uh, is just d mu c nu plus d nu c mu. Or if we do this in terms of uh, polarizations, then uh, what we should be doing is, uh, is something like this. Okay. Um, and immediately, if you do this, you see what you recognize is that this object really is gauge invariant. I mean, this M4 <coughs> under this transformation, uh, well, you get a factor of two because there's two copies. Uh, or we could say you could, you're doing a gauge transfer transformation on one copy, and you're also doing it on the other one, and then you're adding it up, so you get a factor of two. So this is equal to 2ns plus nt plus nu times this alpha. And that is zero at four points. So from here, you get a pretty good idea of what you want to do with this. It's the magic rule. You want to take color, and you want to turn it into kinematics following these rules as long as you can find these kinematic numerators such that they satisfy the same algebra, the same Jacobi identity as the color factors. And that automatically guarantees that you've built a gauge invariant object of spin two. It's just in there. Okay, there could also be spin zero and there's also an anti-symmetric tensor caught in there unless you're symmetrizing, but definitely you've picked up the spin two object uh, in this construction. Now, of course, you might ask, is this really the graviton amplitude? Uh, anyway, let me just say, yes, it is. And yes, it has been checked the hard way, the Lagrangian, crank it out. Of course, there's much better arguments and much better constructions that prove that, in fact, this is the uh, graviton amplitude. Can you derive this from KOC? Uh, it's connected to it. This, can, this particular thing cannot be derived. But uh, the other way around, you can derive KLT from here. So it's definitely. So for the formula that M is. Uh, is well, I, I, will, I, will, I will derive KLT from here. Uh, deriving this from KLT, it doesn't work. And I'll, I'll explain. Oh, well, it's just because. There's a gauge invariance that makes it unobvious that, of how to do it. But I'll show you the derivation in one direction. Uh, but they're definitely connected. It's, this is not an accident. The existence of KLT has a lot to do with, what, with uh, these relations. In fact, uh, that's the argument I'm going to use to say, yes, we got the graviton amplitude because I'll, I'll obtain the, the good old KLT formula from here. Okay, but before we get there, aha, uh -huh. 
progress. Okay. Um, so before before we do that, I want to talk about um, the first the connection of these numerators to amplitudes. So these numerators, they're not physical things by themselves because they depend on specific choices like gauge choices. If you change the gauge, that numerator is going to change on you, but the story, this basic story, is all going to work exactly as stated, even in uh, different gauges. Uh, now, so let's, so let's actually talk about uh, turning this into a gauge invariant statement, and let's have a look at how that works. So what you want to use is, um, to, uh, what we want to do is we want to eliminate the color redundancy. So there's a relationship between the color factors, and because it, there's a relationship between the color factors, these objects cannot be independently gauge invariant. But if I eliminate all the redundancy uh, from the color factors, then the coefficient in that basis of color should be gauge invariant. So that's precisely what I'll do. So let's eliminate, let's just write CT is minus CU minus CS. So this is the Jacobi again. And what I want to do is use this equation uh, right in my uh, four-point amplitude. Aha! Uh -huh. Yes, this definitely works better. Okay. Um, so, let's write A4 Yang Mills. So, from here, let's just use this and we'll eliminate, eliminate that. So that gives us uh, NS over S minus and t over t times uh, cs minus uh, nt over t minus uh, nu over u cu. So all I did, see, all I did was just use that, and then I, I uh, just collected the terms. Uh, now this object here, this is. These color factors are now independent because we've used up all the algebraic relations between them. If these objects are independent, that means that this object is a gauge invariant object. Now, what is this object? This is, did appear in, uh, in Newton's talk. Uh, this is what we would call a color ordered amplitude. So, this one, one, two, three, four. So this is color stripped. This, see, the color has been stripped off of it. So remember when Newton was an, an, answering the question about the three vertex and the photon, he explained there's a color factor, and then there's the kinematic part. And this object here is gauge invariant. It's not the full amplitude, because it's missing its color factors, and also does not have crossing symmetry. It only has cyclic symmetry. And this, we can give another name. This is another color ordered amplitude, and the ordering 1, 3, 2, 4. And the way you can build these out of Feynman diagrams, actually you can see it's a subset of the Feynman diagrams that respect the cyclic ordering of external legs. Okay. So that's, that's good. Um, and Maybe just as a little aside, since we're going to use it later. Uh, so an example of that would be uh, that the, the uh, Park-Taylor amplitude. So this would be in the helicity notation that Euton uh, was describing. Okay. Um, so, um, what we want to do is we want to try to uh, uh, invert things uh, and express these numerators in terms of these gauge invariant objects. That seems like a good idea. So let's see what happens. Um, so 
Uh, so we write down A1234 is uh, NS over S minus NT over T. And uh, what we want to do is eliminate, see there's NS, there's NT, and there's NU. But they're related to each other because the, uh, right, this is zero. It's just the Jacobi identity, so that's zero. So we want to eliminate one of them. Um, so let's get rid of NT. So let's write NT is minus NS minus NU. Uh, so that gives us a nice equation. minus NU over T. Uh, so I just got rid of the, N, uh, the NT in favor of the NS. Uh, oh, and there's a wrong sign here, sorry. And then, it, oh. Yes. Uh, let's go over here. So uh, the other one, A1324, is uh, NT over T minus NU over U. And that's equal to minus NU 1 over U plus 1 over T minus uh, NS over T. And we can write this in a matrix form. Let's just write it out as a matrix. A1234, A1234, uh, one, Sorry, one, three, two, four. One over S plus one over T, one over T, minus one over T, minus one over U, minus one over T, NS, NU. So, if you could invert this, then you could solve for the numerators in terms of the amplitudes. But uh, that seems like it shouldn't happen because these are gauge invariant and these are not, so something's gonna should go bad on you, and indeed it does. You can check that should be a T. You can check that this determinant, the determinant is minus S plus T plus U over S T U. That's equal to zero, so you can't invert. But we can do something almost as good. We can try to solve for, let's say, NU in terms of these gauge invariant objects, and then we just see what happens. So uh, the equation we want to solve is, uh, let's write it as uh, T A1234. So I'm just reading from the first line. I'm going to just multiply through by T plus uh, equals T over S plus 1 NS plus uh, NU. Uh, or NU is equal to TA1234 minus, well, I'll just do a little arithmetic. I'm going to get, uh, uh, I'm going to get U. Oh, this, this came from a T plus S, uh, no, minus T plus S, um, uh, NS. Um, so, okay, that's very nice. So I say, well, okay, why don't I uh, uh, substitute back in to try to, for the equation, see there's an equation for this one. So let me substitute this back. Uh, uh, these two elements in this uh, left column are linearly dependent? 
they're linearly, they're independent. Uh, they're, uh, sorry, they're, 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 well, right, sorry. Uh, just give me in about 30 seconds, and then in 30 seconds I will tell you what the dependence is, because that's in fact what I am deriving. Uh, they look like they're linearly independent. They're gauge invariant, separately gauge invariant coefficients of the color fag. They look linearly independent, but in fact they are, they are not. Uh, so let me take this. You see, there's the second equation. Let me plug it back in. Okay, just a little tiny bit of homework so I can actually finish on time. Plug it in. Okay, so it's just a simple exercise. Plug it in, and what you discover is something pretty amazing. Um, this NS, this, this uh, NS, so uh, this function drops out. So you get a simple, a simple formula. A1, 1, 1, 3, 2, 4 is equal to S over U a one two three four. So it's just a it's just a simple homework assignment. So in fact, there's the dependence, and the key thing is that N S dropped out. In fact, you could say it just drops out of physical quantities. So N S you can think of as a gauge choice. Let's call it a generalized gauge choice. Now, this includes ordinary gauge transformations, but it includes anything you please. NS is completely arbitrary. It doesn't affect the relationships between amplitudes. Uh, completely drops out. Um, and th these relations. Is it possible to give a dependent proof of this equation? Uh, uh, actually, this equation was proven 40 years ago or 30, 30 years ago. You can find it in Green, Schwartz, and Witten. <laughs> so th this is known for a very long time, this equation. Uh, well, it is a four-point amplitude. Uh, and of course, the, the question is, what's the significance of that equation? So it looks maybe like some kind of an accident, but, but it actually is of deep significance because there's a whole pattern of relations, and we'll see this is very important for trying to understand uh, how this double copy works. Okay. Uh, so we'll call these amplitude relations, or Yang-Mills uh, amplitude relations. And uh, to give you an, a less trivial one, let me just quote one. But the derivation it's the same idea. If you can figure, see how that one works, uh, it, it's the same problem except more algebra. Uh, so let's say at five points, there's a relation, again, one of these color ordered amplitudes. Minus S14. S24 plus S25, A14325 is equal to zero. So this one is less trivial. Um, so the S, Sij, I'm just defining as Pi plus Pj squared. So it's just the kinematic invariant. So this is, you could say, a hidden relation that you wouldn't be able to see very simply. Um, and yes, this can also be derived in string theory. Um, okay, so let's have a look at what happens. Now that we know this, then let's play a little game. So we'll take this M4 that we said was a graviton amplitude, um, some kind of spin to something, and we want to see if we can recognize it uh, in terms of something. Uh, so we start, so let's put a plus i there. That's just a phase, that's some normalization. And t square over t plus n u square over u. And what we do is exactly here. We use these equations 
right? We have two equations. Uh, one of them Well, we have ns plus, uh, and let me write it as uh, nt is equal to minus ns minus nu. And then I have this other equation for nu. So what do I want to do? I want to plug this, these two equations. I want to plug it right in here. Another very simple homework assignment. Actually, you do it on the fly. Just type it into Mathematica, simplify. Uh, then what you find is that this immediately collapses to uh, Yang-Mills expression. Uh, whoops. Oh, yeah. That's fine. Like this. Uh, it's just the square of Yang-Mills. Now, th this qu isn't quite the way that the Coilon and Tai formulas are written, but you can shake it a little bit more. Where is this relation? You use this relation, maybe with some relabeling, and then you can rewrite it one more time. And the question is, can I make it fit? Uh, probably not. Okay. Uh, and a minus i, um, and then a Yang Mills one two three four times a 1, 2, 4, 3. And this, in fact, uh, is what we would call a kawhi lone and tai relation. And in fact, even before kawhi lone and tai, this was known as string theory. Uh, what kawhi lone and tai understood is how to genera generalize this to arbitrary numbers of legs. Um, so, it, well, if you accept these kawhi lone and tai relations as the truth is coming from string theory, then this is a proof that we have, in fact, gotten the graviton amplitude. We just have to put in the appropriate coupling constants. Okay? And there's, of course, a uh, five-point relation. Where did my... Oh, here it was. There it is. My fi this is the five-point relation for Yang-Mills amplitudes. And there's a relation, of course, uh, kawhi lone and tai five point, which has some similarities to this. It's not an accident, uh, the relationship between this equation and the, and the kawhi lone and tai one. I'm not going to bother writing it down. You can find it uh, in our notes, uh, what the, what the uh, five point relation is. Okay. And in fact, this is understood for arbitrary numbers of legs, exactly what the relationship between the color ordered amplitudes of Yang Mills and those of, of gravity. Now, this is all very good, uh, but what we would like to do is get away from the trees. We want to do loops. There's a lot of interesting problems to work on if, you're, if you have the ability to do loops. Now, the way this is formulated, it's not so obvious exactly how you're supposed to uh, carry this over to problems and loops. I will talk about that, how to translate this into loops, but, uh, but, what, but uh, there's an even better way to get to loops, and that's uh, on a slightly different path, which is to generalize this relationship between color and kinematics. Oops, I need my good eraser. There it is. Um, so what we want to do is uh, generalize this uh, relationship between color factors. I had CS plus CT plus CU. There's some equivalence between 
uh, to numerators, kinematic numerators. And now what I'd like to do is uh, expand this to the case of arbitrary numbers of legs before we talk about uh, the loops. So the basic idea is pretty much like at four point. You have some uh, tree amplitude. And what we do is we uh, expand it out. Maybe let me put in my coupling constant, although most of the time I'll drop coupling constants. We expand it out into a set of diagrams. Maybe with an index i. So that'll be the numerator, color factor, and then some uh, set of propagators. So these would be uh, Feynman propagators, alpha i. So that's Feynman, that's Feynman, that's our color, and this is, uh, well, this is anything that's not a color factor or a propagator, you stick it in the numerator. kinematic numerator. And what we do is we uh, assign everything to these cubic diagrams. By cubic I mean there's only three-point vertices. If you have anything with a four-point vertex, you just multiply and divide by appropriate propagators uh, to put back the missing propagators. Okay? So writing this, that's trivial. I mean, I just wrote it and I said, multiply and divide, you're done. And that's basically all there is to it. Uh, the non-trivial part is this idea that if you pick three diagrams, so let me pick three diagrams, and those three diagrams happen to be related by uh, some colored Jacobi. So this is, these legs can hook up anywhere, but so I have these legs inside the, di inside the diagram A, B, C, D. And then I have three diagrams. The rest of the diagrams are identical, but uh, what we do is we pick three of the legs and we do a cyclic permutation on them. That's a way of generating the Jacobi identity. So let's call this diagram I, and this one diagram J. Okay, so that was DBC, so now let me put CDB and A here. So that's my three diagrams. These three diagrams, K, okay. Kind of trivially, they satisfy Ci plus Cj plus Ck equals zero. That's just the Jacobi identity. And the non-trivial statement is every time you see this, but generically, not like because of some accident, like some, like let's say you're using SU2 and there's some spe special property of SU2, that doesn't count, but just gener generic properties meaning just the Jacobi identities. Uh, the assertion is that you can always do that. You can always find a set of numerators. And, uh, and you'll say, well, that's very neat, but what are you going to do with it? And of course, the answer of what you're going to do with it is what you're going to do is uh, make a replacement to, uh, let me just put a twiddle on it. Let me just put a twiddle on this. It's just some numerators. Uh, such that, there it is, in that formula where I see the color factor, I replace it with a set of numerators. And magically, I get gravity. All I have to do is convert the coupling constant and then uh, and I and I twiddle the product over the propagators um, and this is a gravity th gravity theory. 
Now, the reason why I have an n twiddle here is it doesn't have to be the same gauge theory as for the n. All right, this, these could be completely separate gauge theories with com completely separate amplitudes. And there's another important fact. You can see this, you can actually see the, the hint of this uh, right here. See, as long as this one satisfies the duality, then you see the same color, right, the, sa the same uh, algebra. That means that this is going to have a gauge invariance in it automatically. You don't have to think too hard about it. Um, and in fact, you only need one of these two copies to actually satisfy that explicitly. Presumably, they both w will satisfy it, but maybe for whatever reason, this, this case is too hard, so you don't actually have it handy. You only have one of the copies, like n equals 4 super yang mills, and maybe a, a, a problem in QCD, and you're trying to build some theory like n equals 4 supergravity, all you need is one copy to work. So, so that's very cool. Okay. Um, now, I'm not going to present the proof of this. However, I'm going to do something better than a proof. I will give you a formula. And the formula is the proof because the formula is the, uh, gives you a set of numerators that has this property. And you can always do this. Um, so the idea is uh, what we do is we're going to focus on the following set of diagrams. So this would be, uh, let's say there's leg one here and there's leg m here. And then over here I have a set of legs. Uh, let's say, um, so this would be, uh, let's say, 2, and then all the way to m minus 1, and there's a bunch of legs here. So let me just focus on this. And the idea is every other diagram, for example, a diagram where, see, it looks something like this, where two of these I, I, uh, I uh, kind of pinch outwards like that. I can use a Jacobi relation to always bring it back into this form. The Jacobi relation is that this numerator is related to the one with the legs <laughs> in this ordering minus the legs in that ordering. Okay? So if I specify what these are, and then the Jacobi relations carry you uh, t to, um, to all, all the, uh, the, the rest of the numerators. And that formula is the following. So let me leave these two legs alone. And then these tails are permutations. So there's a, there's a permutation So let me consider a, there's a permutation of these legs between here and here. Uh, and I'll call that permutation tau, so the legs can be moved around. But I want to leave these, these end ones alone. And this is equal to Uh, S uh, M minus 3. So, it, so this, there's a permutation here of um, uh, 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 M minus 3 elements. A 
Okay, so this upper line is true. So this one is true for a tau is equal to m minus 1. And I mean tau m minus, sorry, tau, tau, what do I say, tau mi m minus 1. Tau m minus 1 is equal to m minus 1. So you're leaving this permutation. This leg gets left alone. This one is, is just m minus 1. And if it's out of order, then uh, you just get 0. And this object here, this is what we would call the KLT kernel. KLT. So that's the same object that you find in the Kawhi Long and Tai formula. So you can go look this up. Uh, and this is a tree amplitude, so that you know. And this tells you then the set of uh, these BCJ numerators that actually have all the properties that I was sta I was I want. All of this is going to be satisfied. And guess what your homework is? You can go check that. Well, you might want to start with like a five point before you, you start thinking about uh, doing this at end point. Uh, I don't know if I can have like another 30 seconds uh, just to, to show, uh, uh, or maybe I'll do it in the next lecture, never mind. I'll start the next lecture with uh, slides. Um, well, let, let me just make a few comments. So, so this is actually a construction that has all the properties that I was speaking about, namely this. Uh, so this is your proof that I found you the objects. You can define a set of diagrams that have these numerators, and then you can check that this explicitly has this for arbitrary numbers of legs. So that's your proof. Uh, now this, this object has some things which are not so nice. You may notice that this is a tree amplitude, therefore it, it's non-local. That means the numerator is a non-local. Crossing symmetry also has some set of problems. Um, and uh, of course, there are much better constructions uh, that, that uh, actually do have locality properties. So anyway, there's the proof. It's just a formula. OK, so next time, uh, I'll start talking about loops. Uh, if you wish, yeah, yeah. It's in fact this is, yeah, it, it, this is how it was realized because by looking at the KLT formula, you could recognize that there were uh, these BCJ numerators. That, that's one proof. There's actually many other ways of proving this, uh, but but I mean this is I love this is the, my favorite proof because I I, I don't have to actually. Uh, you know, go through and explain how it's proven. I just give you the formula and I say, look, it's a proof because we have the formula. Okay. More question. Um, how have you now written the gauge dependent N in terms of the gauge invariant amplitude? Uh, it, uh, because I chose a special gauge. <coughs> yeah, yeah, it's a very special choice that I, I, I made, absolutely. Yeah. All gauges are equal, but some are more equal or better for various purposes. Yeah. You said that n and n total could come from different gauge theories. Does right. that mean SUN gauge theories with different n, or does it mean any? Uh, I mean completely different. Uh, so well, uh, we could take, uh, like a typical thing would be to take uh, uh, pure Yang mills with no supersymmetry and take the double copy with n equals 4 super Yang mills. And then on the other side comes n equals 4 super gravity. Right. I'm sort of talking about what sort of the algebra is allowed to build a uh, You see, in this construction, it's kind of irrelevant because the only thing I used was this very generic property. So any SUN, anything where I have my Jacobi identity, that's kind of a funny, funny thing, a little unexpected. Okay.